will tell you something about glycans, which we believe are the modifiable biomarkers, but also functional effectors of aging. Uh, not so many people are familiar with glycans, so I will just shortly say that they are the ultimate layer of molecular complexity, but in the same time, they are the most neglected molecules of cellular communication. What we see revolving in the middle is the famous S glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2 virus, which stopped the planet for two years, and everything hairy, which you see on the surface of, of the protein, are actually glycans. But unfortunately, many scientists focus on the polypeptide part. Even the director of NIH was blogging about the S glycoprotein without a single glycan on its surface. And, and the only analogy I can make is to study this poor little bird without a single feather. Yes, we can do good science on a bird without feathers. We can study eyesight, we can study physiology, maybe even the walk, but we will never see the bird flying. The same goes for proteins. If we ignore the glycans, we will never see proteins in their full function. Before I go on, a word of caution, uh, glycosylation and glycation are something completely different. So glycation, which we usually measure as HbA1c or advanced glycation end products, is a random chemical damage taking a shotgun and firing at a protein, while glycosylation is a sophisticated modification which occurs to the majority of proteins and it enriches protein structure and function. And one of the key aspects here is alternative glycosylation, which is adding different glycan structures to the same glycosylation site. So different glycans can be added to the same glycosylation site. And functionally, this is analogous to coding mutation. So the coding mutation will change uh, amino acid and have a different protein. Alternative glycosylation will add a different glycan and have a different protein structure. But contrary to uh, mutations, which are inherited in the Mendelian way, glycosylation is inherited as a complex trait in a network of dozens or even hundreds of genes. And uh, nearly a decade ago, we speculated that the glycans are the third revolution in evolution after the appearance of nucleic acids and proteins. And a couple of years ago, in a Nature Chemical Biology paper, we showed the pretty decent evidence that by, by reshuffling allelic variants only three generations, we can generate mouse strains which are completely different without a single mutation just by reshuffling the allelic variant. So actually glycosylation gives another layer of complexity to biology. But unfortunately, glycans are chemically very complicated. Many different glycan structures can be attached to different glycosylation sites. And not so many people study glycans, especially not in a high throughput, because it does require a lot of technical expertise. And we went first in that direction. We studied our first large cohort nearly uh, 15 years ago. And today we have analyzed over 150,000 glycomes. We did it in collaboration with some of the best researchers all around the world. And actually today we generated approximately 80% of the global high tropical glycomic output. There are over 190,000 published glycomes which are reviewed in the Kemmler review paper a couple of weeks ago, and we generated nearly 160,000 of these glycans. And since we did it with collaboration, some of the best researchers, we were able to publish in a high uh, quality journals, including the chemical reviews, gastroenterology circulation, and so on. So there is a lot of hard science about glycans. And one of the proteins that we focus on uh, is immunoglobulin G because for immunoglobulin G, we know that glycans attached to the FC region of a protein are regulating effector functions. So depending on the glycan structure, which is attached here, immunoglobulin will activate the different branches of the immune system and even act anti-inflammatory in some cases when we have this type of glycans. And we know that these glycans also change with age and that we are younger. We have these anti-inflammatory glycans as we are getting older, we get these truncated pro-inflammatory Glycans. And this is regulated in a very complex way by a network of at least 40 genes, which we have mapped through a series of GWAS papers in the last decade. And many of these genes are known risk factor for different diseases. But despite having a large number of genes is heritable, which we have shown in a study of thousands of twins together with the TIM spectre. Later, I will come to the glycan age index and the glycan age index itself is 40% heritable. And the rest of information about the 
glycans comes either from epigenetics, so epigenetic regulation of the genes involved in a glycan uh, biosynthesis, or directly from the environment through the metabolome. And one of the important elements is age. So when we started to look at the large cohorts, we realized that glycans change a lot of age. This is a relatively recent paper showing five different population cohorts, blue are men, red are women, and with age, glycans change a lot. And this enabled us to create the first uh, glycan age block of aging, which was published in late 2013. And the most interesting thing about this a clock of aging was that the, the, the delta between the glycan age and the chronological age was explained by biomarkers which are known to be related with unhealthy lifestyle. Things like the high insulin, fibrinogen, HbA1c, BMI, and so on. So today we have this uh, glycan age index, which is uh, today a commercial test, which is commercially available. And of course, I'm one of the co-founders and uh, co-inventors of this test, and I'm heavily conflicted here. So please use your common sense in judging what I'm saying. So what we know, we know that young people have glycans which suppress inflammation, more and more glycans which promote inflammation, and this drives you know, this cycle, uh, cycle of uh, inflammation, which is both a biomarker of aging, but also the driver of aging. And a question which I often hear is, how good is the glycan clock of aging? Well, the glycan age, Block of aging ticks all the boxes which Steve mentioned in his talk. It does have accelerated aging, the Down syndrome. Interestingly, acceleration happens very early and then the pace goes in the same. Uh, the pace is the same later, but there is a very rapid acceleration in young age. We know that the gaining weight is accelerated glycan aging in the same time is reducing glycan age. And, and some other uh, boxes are also ticked. Interestingly, the acceleration in glycan aging and the first generation of genetic clocks uh, does not correlate. So different clocks, of course, correlate because they all correlate with age, but the acceleration of some of the clocks correlates better. And this is a paper, this is not our paper, it's a paper from the group in Edinburgh. Some clocks correlate better with the glycans, but the first generation clocks does not seem to correlate well with uh, the acceleration in the first generation clocks does not correlate well to acceleration of the glycan aging. What we know that acceleration of glycan aging correlates with the biogeographic factors, different diseases, and the lifestyle, which I will show you now in the next few minutes. So the biogeographic factors, we looked at uh, 27 different cohorts from all around the world, and we see that they are different. But interestingly, the, the parameter which explains the difference the most is actually the expected lifespan and the human development index. So people living in uh, developed countries with a low, larger expected lifespan will have their glycans aging slowlier than people living in a less developed countries with a shorter expected lifespan where the glycans will age faster. Also diseases are a very strong factor. What we see on this slide are different diseases and the effects of aging. So the last four bars are effects of age on different glycans, which are component of the glycan age clock, and then the effects of different diseases. And we see that people with many different diseases change in the same way as with age. So people with a disease will look like an older, healthy person. And in the majority of cases where we looked at, the changes in glycans actually come before the diagnosis of the disease. So what we believe that we see here, we see here IgG glycans as a functional factors which regulate inflammation, and then this low-grade chronic inflammation is contributing to the disease development. And one interesting example is COVID. David Sinclair and I speculated in early 2020 that um, biological age would be a better predictor of severe COVID than the chronological age. And uh, later that year, we were able to show that for glycans, it's indeed the case. So people with a higher glycan age will have a higher risk of severe COVID. But only having, not having a higher risk, but also during COVID, the severe disease will cause accelerated glycan aging. So we have seen people aging 10, 15 years in a couple of weeks with the severe COVID with some of them recovering, some of them not recovering later. And in mild and asymptomatic COVID, we did not see 
any changes. And often the question is, and it's the key question, are these glycosylation changes a cause or a consequence of a disease? And I would say probably both. In some cases, they're just a consequence. In some cases, they're causal. And one of the good examples are cardiovascular diseases. So by studying large cohorts of people, we have shown that IgG glycom composition strongly correlates with the cardiovascular disease risk score. So there is some information in glycans which correlates with the disease risk score, which we then use to persuade the, the people holding the samples from the EPI cohort, which was collected 30 years ago, to give us the samples. And then we looked at the samples collected 30 years ago with a clinical follow-up subsequently. And we have shown that the IgG glycol composition has nearly all the information as entire AHA score is in predicting the cardiovascular events, so actual events, either heart attack or stroke. And some other people did studies suggesting that glycans are actually functional effectors because they affect endothelial biology and the release of nitric oxide from the endothelial cells. And when we looked in our prospective cohorts and we have analyzed 2000 twins in three time points across 20 years, we have shown that indeed glycans change first and then the hypertension develops later. And together with the Phil Scholl from UT Southwestern, we have shown though in an adam, though in an animal model that if you correct the glycans, you can actually prevent hypertension. So what Phil did, he fed mice with a high fat diet. High, these mice become obese and they develop hypertension and they lost cellulation of uh, IgG, meaning their IgG became older. But if he fed the mice with the MANAC, which is anastomanosamine, the precursor of uh, salic acid, the IgG cellulation was restored. Mice did become obese, but they did not develop hypertension. In humans, we don't have um, intervention data. We have only correlation data, which says, yes, few people with a lower cellulation will have a higher blood pressure. So key question is, can we revert it? Can we make a decision to change our glycans, to revert the clock and to stop inflammation? And I think this is one of the key advantages of the glycan age clock compared to other currently available clocks. It does respond to intervention. So if you do an intervention, which is known to be beneficial for the biology, biology of aging, glycans change. And since it is commercially available, we also have data from a number of clinics. I think there are over 300 clinics selling the test globally today. And one of them is um, Joseph Raphael in New York. And the majority of his patients after entering his treatments would become 10, 20 years younger. So there are things which can be done to impure a glycan age. But of course, this is just incidental. This is not science. And we also have some um, famous researchers like a Tim Spector who did an intervention improved his glycan age for 11 years in a couple of months. We actually even recorded Instagram Live. So if somebody is interested, you can see it here. We also know that uh, menopause is associated with a very extensive changes in IgG glycan. There is a rapid acceleration of glycans, glycan aging in the, the period around the menopause. At the individual level, it often looks like this. So somebody would have very favorable glycan age, and then the glycans will get crazy. This particular lady aged 35 years in, in a less than a year. And then people usually freak out, especially because this often happens before any other symptoms of perimenopause. But then with optimal therapy, it can be reverted and go back in the favor of, favorable direction. And we are trying to do some hard science to understand how this happens. And this is a very interesting study where we got the samples where uh, gonadal hormones were chemically blocked and then either supplemented with estrogen or placebo. And uh, ladies on placebo aged on average nine years in six months while the estrogen supplementation did not. Interestingly, in men, it is also estrogen. So testosterone works, but only if you do not block uh, aromatase. If you block aromatase, then you don't have a beneficial effect of estrogen. And what we are now trying to understand how really helpful glycan are in detecting perimenopause, because what we believe is that actually IgG glycan composition is a kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's a reflection of average concentration of estrogen in the last couple of weeks, something like what HbA1c is from glucose, glycan composition is for, for the estrogen. And it does seem to be very predictive. 
we know that um, bariatric surgery can uh, significantly improve the glycan age. We had a patient improving for 37 glycan years in six months. Not everybody improves that much, but majority of people improve significantly. Bariatric surgery may be a little bit too aggressive, but the regular weight loss seems to be working. These are 2000 twins through 20 years. Those who were gaining weight were aging faster than those who were losing weight. We had 1,000 people in Europe, in, in eight centers in Europe on a low calorie diet. Low calorie diet reduced glycan age in everybody, but nobody can maintain a low calorie diet for a long time. So they tested five different maintenance diets. And on each of the five diets, some people improved, some people got worse. So it's highly individual. There is no magic diet. Uh, the same goes for exercise. Uh, the majority of people who started exercising in middle age actually overtrain and they got worse. So exercise has to be carefully optimized. Microbiome, extremely important. We have a couple of papers showing that improving your microbiome is also improving your glycome. So to bring the story to the end, we have this test, which is measuring 24 glycans attached to IgG, for which we know there are functional effects of uh, inflammation. And if your glycan age improves, this means your pro-inflammatory capacity for IgG is decreasing and you are less inflammatory. And we know this is affected with many different factors. And the idea is we don't have to wait until people actually get ill, because usually this is beyond the point of no return. If you just measure the biomarkers here, then the lifestyle intervention or preventive pharmacological intervention can return things to homeostasis and you continue to function normally. Analogy I like to make is uh, imagine if we would be changing tires on our cars only if they explode on a highway. And this is what we do to our body. So we ask for help only when something explodes. Prevention is way better than waiting for the tire to explode. And the glycan age can really help you here because it can motivate people to live healthier. We know what is healthy, but we generally don't do it. We don't do it because the, the payback comes in several decades and we are not that patient. But with an optimal quantification of uh, what is going on with the early feedback, people can get motivated much better. And at the very end, I have to acknowledge that we got a lot of research grants over 20 million euros, which enabled us to do all this research. And I thank you all for your attention. Happy to answer questions if there is still time.